time we designed and built a 3D printed hydroplane, we really learned a lot about what not to do. But in the end, we came up with a design that's pretty fast. However, I wouldn't really say it's reliable since we had to keep on launching the kayak to rescue it whenever it broke down. But this is really because we're reaching the limits of the electronics and design itself. But overall, I really wanted to hit 100 kilometers an hour, which is about 62 miles an hour. But we kept on hitting around 57 or 88 kilometers an hour. So what can we change with the new boat? The simple answer is... <sighs> Unfortunately, more power creates almost as many problems as it solves. Although the old motor was maxing out at around 32,000 RPM, it was also struggling to get that power down due to the rigid prop shaft we used. It's easy to 3D print a hole for a straight drive, but the downside is that the prop has to angle downwards, and when we're on the plane, that downward thrust really wants to push the prop into the air any time it hits a small ripple. So just adding more power to the same design isn't going to work. We solved the power problem by upgrading to a 1.8 kilowatt 3800 kV motor. But that needs a 120 amp speed controller and a much bigger 4 cell battery. And all this is about a half kilogram heavier. So we need to add at least a half a litre of extra volume below the water line if it's not going to suffer the sad fate of version 1. In the end, the only bits of the old design that survived unchanged were the front and rear wings. The new boat is longer, wider in the middle, and has a wider seat on the bottom. The larger battery also takes up space that the radio receiver previously used. So we added a new, hopefully watertight, radio room in the middle. The sponsor design is more or less the same, but a little added flotation on the side so it doesn't turn into a submarine at low speeds. The drive shaft is now also a flex drive, which lets us angle the prop horizontally. This is really the tool for the job, but the hole through the hull can't be straight anymore. So in the end we made the hole just large enough for the curved casing to fit through, and filled it with epoxy to seal it. Okay, enough with the design, let's build it. Every boat needs a name. The last one was unofficially named the Red Baron, but this is a supersonic lobster. It's a third heavier than the old boat, but it should be nearly three times the power. After burning out both a motor and a speed controller on the old boat, we're taking no chances. We've now got dual cooling systems, one for the motor and a separate one for the electronics. We also balanced and sharpened the prop. If you do do this yourself, please read up on how to avoid beryllium poisoning as it is carcinogenic. The lobster floats. It survived a static fire test in the bath, so we were ready to run. And then the weather turned stormy. You really need smooth water, so there's nothing for it but to wait for the wind to drop. Eventually the weather improved, so I decided to risk it. Power? No. Oh, it bounced. Dead. It turns out that a waterproof radio room was full of water, so I removed the receiver from its case and waterproofed it with epoxy. Time to try again. He's not very stable. Oh, he's done it again. Now it only wants to turn left. Turns out that our so-called waterproof steering servo was full of water. Not going to leave a five-star review for this one. But how was water getting in the boat in the first place? Back up to the bath. Speed up. You can see that the water is seeping through the plastic. So what's going on? Firstly, in an attempt to add lightness, we printed the hull only 0.8mm thick. 
Second, we used PLA, which is great for lightweight prints, but isn't all that waterproofed. In fact, it's biodegradable, but we figured it would never be in the water long enough for that to matter. We got away with this in the old boat, but with 1.8 kilowatts of thrust, the lobster is flexing enough to let water through the print layers. We couldn't face a couple more weeks of 3D printing, so I decided to see if we could waterproof it. The best technique we found with what was lying around the house was to wax coat the boat. We rubbed candle wax all over the plastic and melted it with a hot air gun. It's very satisfying the way the wax just soaks right into the plastic. You can barely tell it's been waxed at all. Oh, that doesn't sound great. Well, that went well. Not our fault this time. We hit a large piece of cloth that was just floating right under the surface. It caught on the prop and with all that torque, just rotated the boat straight underwater. Fortunately, I resurfaced with no damage, except for water everywhere. This is why you shouldn't throw your rubbish in the river. We dried everything out and tried again. That's about a quarter power. That's nice. I have done! This is a new record for me! Oh, we have cooling. I see cooling tubes. See two spouts of water coming out. Well, it's fast, but it always seems to be on the limits of stability. Yeah. Oops. Oh, we've lost the we hit our own wake while slowing down, caught the outer edge of the sponson and flipped, ripping the tail right off. Although the sponsons are similar to the old boat, Supersonic Lobster is faster and heavier so the sponsors dig in more when slowing down. We did manage to get a few speed runs in. the video footage we clocked at around 105 km an hour or 65 miles an hour. I wonder if this is the fastest 3D printed boat. We could have stopped there, but I really wasn't happy with its liking for barrel rolls when slowing down. The problem seems to be with this edge here, which digs in and causes the roll. The boat could also do with being wider, so we moved the planing surface 20% further out, increased the dihedral and rounded the outside edge. Hopefully that should help. Well, it's definitely more stable. But that's a bit too much spray at low speed, so we changed the front profile and tried again. The boat seems to accelerate really well, but with a power to rate ratio of around 1500 horsepower per tonne, it certainly ought to. But how quick is it? To find out, 
He built a data logger to record acceleration. This uses an Arduino Nano, an MP6050 accelerometer, and an SD card board. Software isn't really my thing, so I got help with that. But it's actually pretty simple. It's just the demo accelerometer code printing to a file on the SD card. Once it was working, I soldered the three boards together in this weird L shape, as there's almost no space inside the boat, and it's the only way it would fit. So just how fast can it do 0 to 60? Tell me one. Right. Three, two, one. That wasn't a perfect run. It cut out. When the pitch went down, I, I was going full power. But the initial takeoff was pretty good. So let's see what we logged. Here's the horizontal acceleration trace. It pulls 2G until the hull lifts clear of the water then 3G wants its prop riding, before the motor hits its maximum revs and the acceleration drops off. Here's where the ESC cuts out. It slows down at over 2G. No wonder the old spots and dug in when it slows down. It's similar to a bike doing a stoppy. Then the ESC wakes up and we're pulling 3G again. Here's the speed calculated from the acceleration. The red line is at 60 miles an hour and we get there in 1.6 seconds. That's faster than an F1 car. Not bad for a leaky biodegradable boat. I wish I could claim we'd solved all the problems, but we haven't really. I mean, 100 kilometers an hour, 0 to 60 in 1.6 seconds, is all great, but it's not really very reliable. It did that, not me. That was the ESC cutting out again. Next time we'll use a 180 amp ESC. And then there's the opposite problem. I it didn't come off full throttle. It didn't slow down, so I ditched it. That was a pretty big impact, but the damage was minor. The lobster is surprisingly tough. Turns out it pulled 9G in the turn before flipping, then 16G in the crash itself. At these speeds, spray gets in everywhere, and under 3G acceleration, it just forces its way into places we thought were sealed. Even an epoxy coated radio doesn't work so reliably when water gets onto the connectors. It turns out that speed is easy, it's waterproofing that's hard. Next time, I'll make the whole boat out of silicon sealant. Not all problems were due to the boat. This one was definitely pilot error. I forgot there's no reverse. I'm stuck on a thing. I am stuck. I can bring it back, hopefully. I have power. Kayak. Turns out hydroplanes are not very good at towing. Who would have known? We have to wait for light wind days to obviously run the boat, but we're not expecting this kind of weather. Not sure why I chose this day to put a GoPro on board. For the next minute, sit back and enjoy the high speed, high noise onboard footage.
happened so fast. That was another steering servo glitch. The boat turned hard right under full power. In slow motion, you can see the rudder turn just before it all goes wrong. I wasn't worried about the boat, but I really wanted to check if it was still recording so we caught the crash on camera. That's not a happy servo. We opened it up, doused it in yet more WD-40, and then it was happy again. What? That is very sick. Oh, oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh my god, that is ridiculous. It's funny, you told people it's quick, but they don't really believe you until they see it in action. I Go really fast. <laughs> the noise it makes. <laughs> Electricity. Oh. It, it lasts about three minutes the battery, so. Imagine it's like fun. That's why it's just about to sink. I know, it looks like it's gonna sink, but then it just goes no. No. <laughs> Despite all its glitches, quirks and crashes, it's still a huge amount of fun to drive. 